a little bit about me. So I, I co-wrote the, the Async Rust book with uh, Caroline Morton. Uh, I wrote the second and the first edition of Rust in Web Programming. I'm currently writing the third edition. I uh, wrote the book on speed up your Python with Rust and how you combine Rust and Python bindings so you can build Python modules in, uh, in Rust. And uh, I'm also an honorary researcher at King's. In terms of my background, I used to be an A&E nurse at Charon Cross A&E at, at Imperial. Uh, and then I did a second degree in physics and then I did uh, in bioengineering at UCL and then just uh, went into banking and that sort of thing and then kind of floated around programming. But keep, I keep in contact with obviously the medical community. So uh, I just want to say, this before, because there's a bit of a story, and I want to stress this is not a talk about, you know, smart versus stupid or anything like that. Everyone involved is very competent in this story, uh, hardworking and smart. It's, um, it's more about where the gaps are just because of just random chance of people's uh, um, experience as opposed to them not being able to understand something. So um, people who may not know, so King's has uh, been quite low-key, but actually it's a pretty cool center. So it's the largest bioengineering department in the world outside of the USA, and it's the fourth largest in the world. And uh, it has the most advanced hospital in the UK. Um, a lot of the people that I know from UCL Imperial kind of went over to King's because they got all this massive funding, and they have whole suites of uh, robotics and empty surgical theaters and stuff where we test things out. So it's a, it's a very good department. And so the project that I was kind of assigned to, um, and I'm still working on, is uh, surgical robotics is the, um, the computer vision. And what we have is we have a camera that streams into a, a listener server, and um, we get some raw data, and we stream it over to the GPU, and we have a machine learning model that kind of works out where things are, um, in the video feed, and then we tag that data and we store it in a database. Um, and we could also do this with retrospective stuff. It doesn't have to be real time, so we could look at old surgical videos and kind of start to tag them. We can essentially create video search. So um, I, I met with my PhD student that I'm overseeing, and uh, Surreal DB has been very generous in funding another PhD student that will be coming in. Um, and we mapped out what was needed, and Kings were very open in terms of they, they let me advise on how to proceed and how to build the data access layer. And um, instru I instructed the student to start working on the streaming, and we decided on FFmpeg. So uh, if anyone's kind of worked in academia, um, is, again, this is not a reflection on the skill set, but uh, three months in, we kind of ended up with this. So I, I, I kept meeting up with this PhD student, and it turned out, you know, that... I said, look, we need to do some streaming, and I don't, maybe I didn't explain it very well, but he kind of bound the FFmpeg into the code, uh, and then he built, built some tests, and they kind of wrote the whole file. And it was kind of okay, but in terms of real-time streaming, we weren't really going to get anything with this. Uh, and for whatever the cause was, I thought, okay, I've got a weekend, so uh, I came back from a, from a, from a, um, you know, a holiday, and I was like, I need to really get this going. So um, I, I built this um, actor framework, and uh, it was an inference actor that took standard input and output. I calculated the frame size, I created a buffer from this, and I looped in uh, the stuff from the standard input and shot it off to the GPU uh, actor, and it caused the, the ML inference. And, uh, and then I used piping. So before I... Is it good? Yeah, sorry. So before I did that, like um, the GPU drivers were kind of ropey. So if you try and do machine learning, uh, you have to have all these different drivers and they all have to have very specific versions. And if you do like CUDA with CUDA NN with Onyx, if they don't all sync, then it kind of breaks. Uh, and I was using a Linux desktop and I started to install drivers uh, and then my screen stopped working and I realized that my monitor was actually going through the GPU and uh, it was a bit messy. So I started using Docker and the technical applications are, are going to stop soon, but uh, essentially I had to do a multi-layer build and then I had to put the Rust program in, the ML model in, and then I had to mount Docker um, with a GPU runner so it could access the GPU and then you could get the stream in. And we did the stream through piping. So this is an FFmpeg um, command and this is just a toy command that just gives you a, a blank video that's on black frames and you can see I'm piping it into the cargo run so I use standard input and output and um, this kind of took me a weekend you know and what, what was happening before was you know two two three months 
And uh, I could be really arrogant and smug and say, this is the result of me just being really smart. But actually, that's not true. So that doesn't help anyone. And it just ends up alienating people. We don't learn from it. So instead, I sat down and I said, well, how did I manage to do something so quick? Uh, so I had to really look at the experience that I had and see the, if we can try and pinpoint what, what actually why we had such a difference in productivity. And this is what we needed. So we kind of needed Docker, we needed multi-stage builds, GPU access. And this is through managing the Kubernetes clusters through clinical metrics, which was the presentation before. And this is general exposure in, in um, industry as well. So if an academic hasn't been exposed to this, then they just don't know, right? It's not a reflection on their intellect or their hard work. They just weren't exposed to it. The, the second one is the standard input and output. And this is the one that kind of freaked me out a bit because I never read about that on the internet. I never read about it on a book. I lucked out and I ended up working in a financial risk lo loss modeling, you know, a company. And some seniors taught me that trick. Like I would never have known that if I hadn't have gone into that company. And I haven't seen it used in other companies. So that was just some weird fluke that knocked me on the head just out of some random experience. And it was the same with the binary serialization. So you can start to see this bigger picture, right? It's just that I kind of lucked out on some of these experiences and they all kind of coalesce together in order to make this solution that was actually very efficient. And it was the input and output, the standard input and output that was actually stopping the academic from actually getting the streaming into the Rust. Uh, the async as well, so we had to really understand async and that really came about from the book, from the chatbot training, uh, and it came about from general exposure. Uh, and the same with unit testing. So I managed to su succeed quite quickly because I managed to isolate the code. So you didn't have to like progress with the code and mount it to the GPU every time. I isolated that bit with the actor framework, and then I just put in bits and I could test them without having to worry about mounting it to a GPU. So I could code at a much quicker rate. And uh, this came when I was working in financial tech. I, again, I didn't work this out myself. Um, I had some seniors when I started in financial tech, and they literally sent me emails saying, your unit tests are worse than useless. That, that is literally the emails that I got. Um, and they were nice about it. They were really direct. But then they sat down with me for hours, and they taught me how to do proper unit testing. So as you can see here, what, what made it a success was nothing that was genius. I didn't, you know... Um, solve a mathematical equation that no one else could solve or something like that. It was, it was luck. Um, but obviously we have to engineer something so we don't get that. And, and to see what happens when we look at a bigger stage, if we look at nations, um, Taiwan shows us that success is iterative process guided by experience and expertise. So Taiwan has a really good success rate in chip manufacturing. And if we look back at what I just, how I achieved that solution, it was through a bit of guiding from more senior people, and uh, I got some experience elsewhere. Uh, this is no doubt what's happening in Taiwan. If you could just read a textbook and say, well, okay, now I'm as good as Taiwan at creating chips, then Taiwan would not have this lead. It's that they have these mentors, they have this process, they have this guidance. And uh, I see quite a lot of doctors here today. Uh, it's the, kind of the same analogy there. You must have had some sort of guidance from your consultants. You must have had some sort of experience and they take you aside and say, oh, that doesn't usually happen that way. Or in my experience, this happens, you know, so it would be as crazy as me reading a, a book on cardiology and saying, right, I'm going to become a cardiologist, right? There's a, there's all sorts of nuance that comes from it. So before I continue, I just want to add that academia does bring stuff to the table. I don't want to give off the, this notion that, you know, imperial um, industry is great and we're going in and we're showing people how to do their stuff and we're walking out. Um, we can also look at examples where uh, startups have failed because they didn't, you know, um, interact with academia. And Theranos is the prime example. If people don't know, this woman claims that you could get a finger prick through uh, a vial, you know, through a, just a finger prick and you could get a full blood count and all this sort of stuff. And um, she went to academics in the field, medical academics, and they said it can't be done. And she just ignored them and bypassed them and uh, filled her board with people that weren't medical academics and tried to circumvent the system. And we potentially got the biggest fraud in uh, Silicon Valley history and put patients' lives at risk. Um, academics can also pursue areas with, without profit incentives, which are obviously beneficial. Uh, so uh, again, a medical analogy would, would be like um, antibiotic resistance. You know, that's a public health thing. You know, uh, academics pursue this and try and work out what kind of strains are what. 
Um, and they also get verification for a wider community review processes and consensus on methodology. So I, I just wanted to really stress that. I don't want to, you thinking that I'm saying that we're going in and we're just showing academia how to do things. We, we do get a lot of benefits with the King um, partnership as well. So going back to this chip, so this is Robert Cowell, and he was the chief architect at Intel. And um, there's something quite scary about this chip. Um, we had Texas Instruments in America. We had Fairchilds. We had a lot of really good industry. And we still do have good industry in America. But this is um, a passage from what, you know, his interview. And he was having problems when he was trying to design a chip because all these components were kind of breaking. And he went to Texas Instruments, as you can see in this uh, passage, and he says, you know, how did this all fall apart? Why are your chips constantly failing? And you can see the last passage here. You can see, and the guy said, the first generation of transistor to transistor logic was done by the old graybeard guys that really knew what they were doing. The new generation was done by kids who were straight out of school who didn't know to ask what the ch change in packaging would do to inductive spikes. So they didn't pass on their knowledge, they didn't preserve the knowledge, and you actually got reputable companies like Texas Instruments messing up their chips. So what's actually quite scary is that technology declines, and it declines quite aggressively if you do not make active steps to try and maintain it. So we've got some examples here, right? We've got Greek fire, we've got Roman concrete that could set underwater, um, Damascus steel, took a long time to try and replicate. Uh, I can never pronounce that. It's a fancy mechanism in Greece. I can never pronounce the actual name. But they found that there was a load of intricate cogs and then the historians concluded that, you know, the technology had declined and they no longer could produce that. And we can go more modern than SpaceX, right? It's trying to do launches and its launches are blowing up. And uh, we managed to get people to the moon on stuff that was less powerful than our phones. So technology does decline, even in modern eras, even with the Texas Instrument chips. This is something that's not ever going to go away unless we actively work on it. So my King's example um, is an example of potential technology decline. And I would say that them not knowing the standard input and output and me just not lucking out there, that was a very thin hinge of success. That's quite scary. And we should be worried about this. And it's not King's fault. Um, you know, loads of people don't really, have never really used standard input and output to stream huge amounts of data. So uh, when I did go and show it, my student was really nice to me and he said, we couldn't have done it without you. And uh, that felt nice initially. Uh, and I could claim that I was the tech guy. But what happens if I stop turning up or I just lose interest or I go to another company or something like that? That's a lot of pressure to say that like, this robotic project is on my shoulders, right? And it shouldn't be. Because as we've said, the stuff that made it a success was not something that you needed to be a genius to actually achieve. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to draw the attention to Martin Gutman, and he's a historian. Uh, and I ripped this directly from this, this slide directly from his TED talk, so you should really check that out. Um, and he highlights that we we look at leaders, the wrong leaders. Um, and the guy on the left has a really high success rate in polar exploring. He's the first in a lot of things. He's on point. No one died in his expeditions. But we've all heard of Shackleton. And uh, Shackleton was uh, somebody who obviously didn't do as much planning. He wasn't as meticulous. People died. He got into all sorts of scrapes. And because we, these are dramatic, we hear about it, right? And uh, the analogy in this guy's talk is very good. Is if, you, if you have a river and you don't analyze it and you don't try and up your skill in certain techniques to get across the river, and you just jump in, you're going to hit some really nasty currents. You're going to splash all over the place. And bystanders are going to look at you and say, oh, look at that struggle. And if you get across, they'll be like, wow, he really over could, you know, overtook the odds. Whereas if you took the time to study the river and you took certain swimming techniques and you looked at the exact point of the river and slipped in and meandered across to the other side, no one would really notice. And you do have, if someone does notice, they'll probably say, well, that looks easy. So we do have this kind of uh, bias of lionizing individuals. And really, uh, my sign is that when there's heroes around, generally as a sign that the system needs improving. So <clears throat> in short, though, I, it, this isn't 
this this isn't doom and gloom. Uh, I'm I'm actually very optimistic about the future. This is uh, something that I do often bore my colleagues with. Um, if I had infinite money, I would start a monastery of coding, and it would be like a library, and you know, like where people we would we would do unit testing and we would perfect certain areas of code and we'd archive it, and then certain people would come and say, "We're thinking of doing this. Can you tell us?" what techniques have been tried, and we could help them with that. Now, sadly, I, I live in the real world. I don't have the money to run a, uh, a monastery. Maybe if SurrealDB goes public, then we could, we could get the monastery going. But the, the reality is that it's, we are living in a very exciting time. And even though we, we found that hinge where you could see potential technology decline, Kings have been very open-minded and ambitious. So the honesty is, you know, you've seen the prestigiousness of kings. I don't have a PhD. They're still very open-minded in working with me. They're still very open-minded in terms of working with this sort of expertise. When you talk to them, they work really hard. My PhD students are obviously messaging me at the weekends. They're really keen to learn all these different things. So I have a lot of faith. I'm actually very excited at what kings could potentially achieve because of their openness. And I think as well, I also have to, you know, be very grateful to the leadership of, of SurrealDB. I know they're my employer, but I mean, they, they did actually enable this to happen as well. So, I, you know, I can't claim to be a hero and that's because the leadership has been pretty good. And now the student is learning the techniques that we've highlighted, that what caused the success and we're documenting them. So we can try and move towards a more sustainable kind of future. And I'm also very grateful because the interest, uh, we've got some interest from Open UK and they're an open source foundation. They write reports, you know, national reports, that sort of thing. And they're also very keen on this sort of sustainable leadership uh, and bringing forward a more sustainable like future for medical tech. So, uh, and, and this is it really. So we've had it where the first presentation was what you actually do on a platform. The second presentation is to see what can you bring in terms of different perspectives and how can you sustain your knowledge.